we're going to have fun today. How many excited? Come on. We're born excited. Praise God. Father, I pray today, I'm asking, Lord, that you would use this vessel, Lord, that you would empower me by the Holy Spirit, that you'd empower me, Father, to serve. And Lord, touch people today, Father, by your Spirit. Minister to them, Lord, and show them how you can turn things around. Thank you for everyone who will be saved and set free. And Lord, we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Turn to someone right now and say, your turnaround is here. Amen. How many know that God is a specialist in turnarounds? He can turn water into wine. He can turn leprosy into baby skin. He can turn lack into an abundance. He can turn a dysfunctional family into a functional family. He can turn an addiction to someone that's overcome it. He can turn things around in your life. Now, I know about you, but personally, many times in my life, I try to turn around things in my life that are going the wrong direction. And sometimes I don't have the ability to do it on my own. But one thing I've learned is this. There's nothing that God can't turn around. Whatever you're struggling with today, God can give you the turnaround that you need in your life to give you a great blessing. Now, what I want to do is I want to take you to a text in Matthew 4 and show you how this turnaround is possible and show you why it's possible. It's because Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and he has been tempted in all points like we are, except he succeeded and went to the cross for you and raised up. But I want you to see this text. Matthew 4, verse 2 said this, And when Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Say it with me, for it is written. And he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash a foot against a stone. And Jesus said, it is written again that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again the devil took him up onto the exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Notice, notice Satan here says, I'm going to give you all these kingdoms that I've shown to you. And Jesus didn't say, you're lying. Obviously, these kingdoms were his. And then it goes on. Then Jesus said unto him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve, and serve him. Only you shall serve. Praise God. Now, this particular temptation that Jesus went to reveals something. It reveals what Satan stole from us in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. God had put creation into the hands of Adam, given him dominion over everything, but when he sinned, he betrayed the trust that God gave him, and literally handed everything over to Satan. The Bible says that Jesus is referred to as the last Adam, which means there'll never be another one. And so what he did is Jesus came and put on human flesh so that he could be tempted in all points like the first Adam was, yet without sin, so that he could go to the cross and become sin from your sin on himself, to pay for the price for the redemption that God gave us. And then God rose him up so that man could be restored from everything that was stolen from him in the Garden of Eden. People, kingdoms were all taken from us in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. 
That's why we have this ministry. It's called the ministry of reconciliation, the Bible talks about, where we're to go out and those who are spiritually dark, they don't know God, and we're to tell them that God is not mad at you. He wants to reconcile you to himself so that you can receive salvation. But as far as the kingdoms go, Satan doesn't possess it anymore. The Bible says that after the resurrection, Jesus says that God has given him all authority in heaven and earth. So the church needs to wake up and start getting back what has been taken from us. Not only lost souls, but the possessions and the things that God has given us in this world is not for the sinner, it's for the believer in Christ Jesus. And it's our job to occupy and bring it back. The truth of the matter is, is that God wants you personally to get a turnaround in your life, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your uh, finances, whether it's a health issue. He wants you to get the turnaround in your life the way that God originally designed it. And when we turn to Christ in faith, we can do this. One of the problems that I find with people when, it, when we talk about faith is a lot of people go, well, well so-and-so did it, and they got it, and, and they did it, but, but I'm not sure that is for me. I want you to understand that faith qualifies you for everything that God promises. In other words, when faith is in operation, you automatically become the one that it's for. Let me say to you this way. Remember in Romans it says that uh, we were saved by the law of faith. The law of faith is the principle on how faith works. When you're in faith, you believe what you say. That particular law puts you in a position that you can receive everything that God has promised. It's kind of like in creation. When God created the earth, it says all things are made by him and all things are held together by him, Right? And we know that his creation has natural laws, the law of gravity, the law of lift, the law of thrust. And all those laws have been in creation from the beginning of time. In other words, they, didn't, they weren't created after the airplane was created. They were, they were created before then. In fact, Moses could have flown in a jet if man had had the wisdom necessary during that time to create an airplane. The laws of gravity and lift and all that was always there. The law of faith has always been there, the principle behind it, and that principle puts everyone in a position where they can freely receive from God whatever they need from God. In other words, they become that person. See, the law of gravity says anybody that steps off a cliff, you're going to go down. I don't care if you're tall, short, skinny, overweight, intelligent, unintelligent. You're going to fall. It, in other words, it's no respecter of persons. Faith is no respecter of persons. It will work on the intelligent. It'll work on the unintelligent. It'll work on people with hair. It'll work on people without hair. It'll work on gray hair. It'll work on blonde hair. Come on, it'll work on everybody as long as you operate within that realm. This is why you see stories like with the woman with the issue of blood. She heard about Jesus, faith came, and she kept saying, if I just touch him as garment, it shall be whole. In other words, she believed what she was saying. And she pressed through the crowd, and when she touched him, the Bible said that power came out of Jesus. He felt it come out and touched her, and he says, who touched me? Now, some people go, well, Jesus is God. He knew it who touched him. No, Jesus is 100% God, but he didn't operate as God when he was on this earth. He operated as a man anointed with the Holy Ghost because in the Bible it says in the book of Isaiah that God doesn't get weary, God doesn't get sleepy, God doesn't get wore out, but Jesus got wore out, Jesus got sleepy because he was operating from his humanity anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. Amen. Say amen, everybody. Amen. So he feels the power go out and the, the, the apostles said to him, all these people are touching you, but yet she was the only one that the power came out of. That's because she was the only one that day that was operating in the realm of faith. Everyone else wasn't. And that's why she received. Are you listening to me? 
every one of those people could at the power of God could, could have went out and touched him but she was the one that day that had the faith that believed what she said would happen and when she touched him the power went out it's no respecter of persons someone ought to get excited right now in other words you say well I don't know if God wants to heal me use your faith and that law will always work for you just like it worked for anyone else that used it faith the law always works that means you don't have to wait in line and go, well, maybe, you know, I got to get in a special group to be the, you know, no, 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 no. Just operate through the principles of faith and whatever is promised will come to you, period. It's for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, that blessing will come forth. Now, here, here's a part about a turn, turnaround I want you to see. God is able to turn things around even when we don't have a lot to offer. In other words, he's able to take what is little and turn it into much. Now, a lot of people say, well, I just don't have enough. No, God can take the little you do have if you use it in faith and multiply it even more so. One of my favorite miracles is when Jesus fed the 5,000. A couple of things to note. Number one, they had numbered the crowd. There was 500 men. So we know the crowd was somewhere between 15,000 people women and children and so Jesus could have taken the five loaves and the two fishes and only multiplied enough for that group of people he had numbers Uh, but he didn't do that he took the little and multiplied more than enough of plenty left over there was 12 basketfuls of food left over and I don't know if you ever studied this, but it said that everyone received as much as they wanted. In other words, you could go back for seconds and thirds and fourths and fifths. And when we have a luncheon here at the church, we, we find out how many people want to come. And then we tell the men, like for breakfast, you can only have a couple piece, pieces of bacon. Each person only get a couple. No, Jesus said you can have as much bacon as you want. <laughs> Amen. So the point is he takes the little you have if you do it in faith and he multiplies it. So you you may say, well, I don't have much to offer. You know, my marriage is struggling. I don't know what to do. God can turn it around with the little that you have to offer in faith. Or, you know, I need a financial breakthrough, but I don't really have much I can do here. God can take the little that you have and he can bring increase in your life. Or you say, I just, I don't have a lot of faith for divine healing, but I'm sick. God can take the little faith that you have and he can multiply it, praise God, and give you the breakthrough that you made in your life. It may take you a little time to get to it, but praise God, he is able to take little and turn it into a lot. David said, my cup runneth over. Hallelujah. In other words, he believed in the fullness of God. He believed that God was able not only to turn it around, but to turn it around in a big way from little effort. Come on. He's able to turn around your finances, turn around your life, turn around your attitude, turn around everything in your life. Ooh, man, I love this. When you think about this, I always think of that story of the woman who had just a cruise of oil. She went to the prophet and said, my husband is tied. Creditors are coming because husband didn't plan. And they're coming and I've got this debt and they want to take my sons and turn them into slaves for seven years to pay off the debt. And I want my kids to stay with me. And so the prophet says, what do you got in your house? He says, well, all I got, which was much, was a little cruise of oil. And then she tells him, she says, go out and borrow not a few vessels, but many. So she had to go out and get many. But you remember the story? Went back in the house, started pouring that vessel. They started filling up, filling up, filling up, filling up, filling up, until eventually it stopped because they didn't have any more vessels. And she sold it, prophet told her to, paid off the debt, and then lived off a healthy retirement that came from that increase. She only had a little bit, but she ended up living the high life with her kids at home, praise God, retired, say amen. You're not too excited about that part. I, but I want you to see that, that God can take the little you have 
and bring you a great increase in your life if you dare to believe. But you've got to operate in this realm of faith for it to work in your life the way that God wants you to work. In other words, let me say it this way. Faith, a simple definition, is faith is when you believe what you say. I said you just believe what you say. You believe, I'm overcoming. That's faith. You believe, I don't think I'm going to make it. That's not faith. But when you believe what God's word says about you, and you say it and you believe it, your mind may may be going crazy, but no, I believe it. That's faith. And it reminds me of that story in Matthew's Gospel 9, 27 to 29, when two blind men came to Jesus, and, and Jesus said to him, he says, do you believe I can do this for you? I said, yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes and said, be it done unto you according as you believed. And the miracle happened. Now, here's the question I want to get across to you is this. They believed because of what Jesus said. And they believed that when they said, yes, we can believe, they believed that was so. And here's where a lot of you run into trouble, and I'm going to help you. Where you need God's word on certain areas so that you know what to believe in. One of my favorite verses in Joel chapter 2, I believe it is verse 15, it says this, it says that God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Say years. Years. Now, why did God say that? Because he wants you to know that no matter how many mistakes you've made in your life, that God is still able to restore you. No matter how many divorces you've been through, God is still able to, to, uh, not destroy you, but restore you. No matter how many financial problems that you've went, bankruptcy, whatever, God is able to restore you. No matter whatever you have been through... God is able to restore you. In other words, we're all stupid, and I'm in the same group. We all make mistakes, and God said, listen, if you've made a lot of mistakes year after year after year after year, and you have all these problems in your life, I want you to believe what I said. I said that I can restore all those years that you lost because of a lack of wisdom, because of disobedience in your life, but all you gotta do is believe it. Do you believe that he can make a good marriage when you're on your fourth one? Now, I'm not suggesting anybody divorce here, but I'm dealing with people that are broken. A lot of people have problems. And I'm not, you know, judging one person over another person. I'm just simply saying that God is able to turn around your relationships. He can take that new relationship and he can turn it around and make it better than ever it's been before. And you know, when you read on in Deuteronomy when he talks about restoring those years, you read down and it talks about the different levels of destruction that Satan does. And in the first chapter, the levels of destruction start out with the least amount of damage first and then end with the worst. Five things. In the prophecy, Joel puts the, 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 the least amount of damage at the end of the list instead of the beginning of the list. You know why? Because he wants you to know that God can not only restore the serious damage in your life, but he can also restore and will the least amount of damage in your life. You know, people that go through trials and people go, well, I'm damaged goods. God's saying, no, 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 no. I'm not only going to restore the bad things in your life, I'm going to go down to the very the attitude that was affected, the, the fear that was created from it, the, the frustration, the, the anxiety. I'm going to remove all of that in your life if you believe what my word says. And then he says this, which I think is great, and this is the verse above. He says, I'll do it within a month, which he's talking about he'll shorten the time. It won't take years and years and years and years and years and years. I've seen people that are just completely bitter and horrible and all this stuff, and after praying for them, everything changes within a moment. Hallelujah! I don't know about you, but God wants you happy. 
God wants you blessed. God wants you to prevail. He wants to give you a turnaround in your life. It doesn't matter how impossible it seems. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter how far reaching it seems to, be, to grab it. God wants you to have it in your life. But to do this, you know, you not only have to believe, but you have to keep the doubt out while you're believing. It'd be nice if you just believe for a moment and you're done, but you have to believe and maintain that faith or it won't happen to show you the power or the importance of this let me tell you a story in the Bible about John the Baptist's father John the Baptist's father was older and his wife and they weren't unable to have children this is before John came on the scene and John's father or the father to be was a high priest in the temple and during that time in the Bible, they didn't have just one high priest. They had a whole bunch of them. So, you, you know, you might be able to go in and go into the holies of holies by the Shekinah glory maybe once in a year uh, because they didn't have just one high priest. So it was a special moment. John's father-to-be goes in and an angel's in there starts telling him that he's going to have a child the child's going to be called John and he's going to be the forerunner of Christ he begins to doubt a little bit from what the angel says and the angel says alright here's what we're going to do I'm going to mute you until the child is born in other words you're not going to be able to talk until the birth of the child so you're going to have to write down to your wife say mama we're having a baby and the baby's going to be John so I'm going to mute your mouth because, if you, because obviously you're, you're, you're having problems here because of what you said to me. So we need the forerunner of Christ to come. So I'm going to mute you. Some of you need to be muted. Once your wife or your husband gets that revelation of what God wants to do in your life and you start running off, well, we can't afford it, we can't do that, mute them, mute them. It mute them with a kiss just lay a big one on them just say don't say anything baby or it could be the husband likewise the, the, you can see the importance of this Proverbs 6 2 says this it says that people are snared by the words of their mouth snared there was a book that was written it was called hung by the tongue and I think all of us have hung ourselves by our tongue but it's easy sometimes to undo what we start in faith simply because we're overwhelmed by our feelings, overwhelmed by what it really looks like, and we start voicing our doubts. And remember, as soon as you voice your doubts, there's conception. You can have the thoughts going all around in your mind about doubt, and it's not a big deal. But if you think about it too long, you're eventually going to say it because the Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I want to make sure that whatever I'm standing in faith for, I mute the doubt. Pastor, how are you going to do that? Talk to, talk to Pastor Jim. I don't want to talk about it. If I'm in faith for something, I don't want to talk about how God can do the impossible. I want to just believe in faith. I don't want to have to justify standing in faith for something I'm just going to stand in faith and if you want to not have what God says then you stand in your corner and I'm going to stand in my corner but I'm going to get everything that God offers praise God I'm going to stand in faith so you can readily see from that the importance that we do that now here's now I've been around long enough I've seen this in the church I remember a time in the church when people never really asked the Lord for much I, you know, they would, they would pray when it's an emergency. When the doctor says it may be cancer. Or the wife, you know, says, I'm going to leave if you don't change. And so they don't pray until a crisis. And it's almost that mentality, God's in heaven, he's running everything, and he can't mess with your little stuff, just deal with it yourself. But I'm going to show you the verse that really set me free from this. God wants you to ask help from him in every 
area, no matter how big or small it is. Look at this verse. This is Psalms uh, 81 verse 10. Look at this verse. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Amen. Now maybe I need to take this a little bit farther because you're not getting it. You remember when they left Egypt? The women were told, not the men, the women, to go to the Egyptians and spoil them. And that didn't mean bless them. It means take their wealth. Not the men, the women. I can just see them coming up to the door. I'm here to get all of your wealth. All right, take these. And I can just see the women going, well, what about that? What about that gold lamp back there? You know, I got a friend that was a servant here. They said you had a whole bunch back in the back room there. That's what he's talking about. Open wide your mouth and fill it. Say amen. <clears throat> Man, I, I don't want you to, to do what James said. You have not because you ask not. I wonder how many blessings we've lost simply because we wouldn't ask the Lord to help us. He wants you to ask. People get the idea that it all comes automatically. Just follow the Lord and everything happens. It's not automatic. It's not automatic. People that pray in faith get what other people that don't pray in faith don't get. You have to believe what the Word says. Therefore, when you pray, whatever you ask, believe that you receive it. If you abide in me, my word abides in you. Ask what you wish and shall be given to you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you so that your joy is made full. Amen. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. In other words, Jesus is telling us, don't stop asking. Ask in faith so that God can bless you. Turn to your neighbor and say that you've you got to turn up your asking. Come on, if you're married and you're speaking to a spouse, <laughs> do it with caution. But nevertheless, do it. Amen? Now, here's a part that I want you to see that's really going to help. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 36, 37, he said this. He said, every idle word that we speak will be held accountable in the day of judgment. By your words, you are justified. By your words, you condemn. Most of you know that. But he says an idle word. What is an idle word? Let me give you kind of an illustration of what I think an idle word is. If you have an iPhone, how many know that if you are going through looking at all these apps and you leave them running, it drains the battery. So what do you do? You swipe them away. How many know the swipe? That's what an idle word is. It's something that is said that is draining your faith. It is something that is said that is hindering your faith from happening. It's that things that you say when you're discouraged. It's the things that you say when it doesn't look like it's working. It's the things that you say when your emotions are overwhelm you and, and, and you gotta swipe them away. Now, if you don't, when we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm talking here in the context of believers, we're going to be held accountable for that word that we said. Can you see the Lord? Well, you know, I would have given you this, but, and you started out right, you had faith, you studied the word, I, I gave you faith there, you were ready, you were fired up, and, and then you got a little discouraged because it didn't happen as fast as you thought it would, and you begin to say this and say that, and then your wife began to say this and say that, and so I had to cancel the miracle. Could have had it, but because you had idle words you killed it or the Lord said listen I had blessed you and you could have had more than enough of plain left over you could have left not only an inheritance to your children's children you could have had even more than that but every time I would give you faith for it you would go out and start looking at your checkbook again you start looking at the world news you start looking at your skill level and you begin to say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. 
And every one of those idle words killed the blessing that you could have had. You could have been mighty like Job, but you missed it. Still get to go to heaven, but you don't get into the Lord. And then I'll be standing there in line. I'll walk up. Jesus will say, Jack, get up here. I want to talk to you. You threw down those idle words, and you were persecuted for it. But I started giving you what I said I would give you. And now I'm not only going to give you that, but I'm going to give you an eternal reward. And that eternal reward is going to last forever. It's going to put you into the millennium. And it's going to put your position in Christ where you're not down the street, but you're up the street. Come on, everybody. Say amen. I want to be there, not here. Oh. The Bible says that Jesus returns. Some, some believers are going to be ashamed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know, you know, whatever. Let's not just, let's get away from that. Let's, let's fix it right now. Fix it right now so that God can bless you in a great way. Write this down. I'm going to wind this up. Second Chronicles 20, 20. This is a story about a king that's in trouble. His name is Jehoshaphat. He's outnumbered, he's outgunned, he can't possibly win who's coming against him. He's got kingdoms coming against him. And in the story, he goes to the Lord, he's afraid. The prophetic word is, the battle is not yours, it's mine. But he says something to the people before they send out the praisers, not with guns, just praisers, because they're going to have in faith. He says this to him, and I love that. He says, Believe the Lord, and you shall be established. Believe the prophets, and you will prosper. Two things he wants you to do. Believe the written word, and believe how God is leading you. And God was leading them just to praise the way through this. God was going to fight the battle. And you know the story? One angel come down and whipped them all. Amen? Here's the point that I want you to see. If you want to get a turnaround... You have to believe the leading of the Lord in your life. You have to put faith in the written word. Not just God, what God is leading you, but also the written word as well. And if you do, you're going to get that breakthrough that you desire in your life. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, let me tell you something about prophecy. Prophecy doesn't mean it's automatically going to happen in some prophecies. Prophecy can be the result of if you believe, this will happen to you. Hezekiah is a great example. He went to the, to the he called the prophet because he was sick. He thought he was going to die. And he wanted to find out from the prophet, what you, you know, what's the verdict? Am I going to die? Am I going to recover? And the, king, and the prophet came in and said, get your house in order. You're surely going to die. Why? Because he's a king, he can't just drop the ball. He's got to hand it over to somebody. So that was a prophetic word. You're going to die. And in the state that he was in, he would have died. But he changed the state. And he turned his face towards Jerusalem and prayed. And the Lord spoke back to him and said, I'll give you another 15 years of life. Stop the prophet. The prophet went, came back and said, God just said now, you get 15 more years. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's automatic. He could go ahead and, and scuba dive with sharks and, and do all the dangerous things, and he'd be fine. No, he had to stand in faith for the next 15 years to get that promise to happen. People think prophecy is just automatic. If it's conditioned on faith, which most of it is, you have to stay in faith for it to happen in your life. You need to turn around. You not only need the faith for the turnaround, you need the faith to keep it alive during the turnaround. During the turnaround. I'm going to continue to believe no matter what it looks like, no matter how I feel, no matter what's going on, I'm going to continue to believe. I'm not going to allow an idle word in my mouth. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know if you can stand what I'm about ready to say. I'm going to give you some revelation here that will get you so excited. 
you'll see the difference between religion and a church that has power. A church that has power has one thing in common. They have faith in Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, there's power. But if you just have faith in God, that's not going to do it. you got to have faith in Jesus. I want everybody to stand up right now. I want you to hear this. This is really powerful. Say it with me, Jesus. Jesus. Name is above every name. I've seen many people who pray to God and don't get any results. Praying to God will not get you any results until you have faith in the name of Jesus. Now, I'll give you an example. In the New Testament, before Jesus went to the cross and died, uh, his disciples were given one instruction. Take my name and cast out devils, heal the sick. We have no record of them ever praying during Jesus' ministry. They didn't need to. They go to Jesus, and he's speaking for the Father. Amen? Amen. So they went out, and they didn't pray for anybody. They just said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, demons come out. It wasn't until the end of Jesus' ministry, before he went to the cross, he said, after that day comes, you're not going to ask me for anything, because I'm going to be in heaven. Here's he says what I want you to do. Whatever you ask the Father... In my name, he will give it to you so that your joy might be made full. Are you listening to me? We were baptized in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We cast out devils in the name of Jesus. Everything we do is in the name of Jesus. Go in my name. Make disciples in my name. Hallelujah. But it's Jesus. It isn't just praying. I'm praying in the name of Jesus that has been exalted above every name. It's Christ. Father, I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. I'm asking that you'd hear my prayer powers released. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. Because of faith in the name. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus, open your blind eyes. In the name of Jesus, get a turn around. Jesus. Now watch what happens. I want you to say this with me. Everybody just... Yell it out loud. In Jesus' name, name. I'm having a turnaround. turnaround. Say it again. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. the supernatural's coming. coming. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. I'm not leaving the way that I came. In the name of Jesus, I'm more than a conqueror. Come on. Come on. Come on. Woo! Mm. Oh, my Lord Jesus. My Lord Jesus. Did you ever notice in politics they never mention Jesus? We pray to the creator of creation. Ask me, President, to pray. I will pray. In the name of Jesus, not Buddha, not Muhammad. But Jesus Christ is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Now when I pray, God hears. There's no other way to the Father except through the Son. No other way. Be as religious as you want, but there's just no other way. you got to have Jesus. I want everyone to pray right now. Bow your heads with me. In this service, meeting Jesus was the turning point in my life. I used to go to traditional church when I grew up, but I didn't know Jesus. I knew about religious formats. I knew about the cross, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know him personally. I knew of him. I knew he went to the cross and died for me, but I wasn't saved. You know how many people believe that Jesus went to the cross and rose again that are going to hell? millions and billions of people Satan believes that he's not going to heaven you have to believe that Jesus died for you personally and that you're going to confess him as Lord and believe what you say 
Lord, you're Lord over my life right now. I believe that you died for me and you rose again. Today in this service, if that is you, and you say, man, I want to meet this Jesus. I want you to exercise some faith. I want you to lift your hand up to heaven wherever you're at. Let me pray for you. Thank you for that hand right there. Anybody else? Over there and over there. If I miss you, please forgive me. See another hand right there. This is in the back. God bless you, I believe. Could all of you raise your hand and want to Could you come on down to up front here? Let me pray for you real quick. Come on. Come on down. We're going to pray. Come on down, son. Amen. Amen. God bless you, bro. I'm so happy for you. Praise God. Come on over here. We're going to pray. I see a few. I saw some hands in the way in the back there. Uh, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but if you did, do need Jesus, come on over. We're going to pray. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anyone else? There's a young girl right there. Come on down. Come on down front. We'll pray for you. As long as your mom says it's okay, we'll pray. We'll pray. Amen. What's your name, sweetie pie? My name is Michaela. Michaela. Yes. Do you know a lot about Jesus? Um, not very much. But you want to know him personally. You want him to be your best friend. All right. Praise God. Anybody else in the house? Anybody else in the house? All right, let's go ahead and we'll pray this together. Say it with me, Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe, Father, that you sent Jesus into the world to die for my sins. And I believe that you rose him from the dead so that when I believe in him, I'd be justified before you. I'm declaring him as Lord and Savior in my life in Jesus' name. Father, pour your spirit upon him right now. Let the Holy Spirit fill him full and overflowing. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Listen, right down there, if you guys will run down there and you can go with them, they're going to give you something. It's right over there. Follow the big guy down there. Yeah. You know, I love the uh, ministry of Jesus, how he made it so simple. It was really not that complicated. Now, I believe that today, because of the name of Jesus, there's some turnarounds in this church. Turnaround in relationships. Turnaround with your finances. But remember, it won't happen just because you exercise faith. You have to have faith in Jesus. That because of him, your turnaround is coming. Everyone that loved Jesus right now said, thank you, Father, for the turnaround. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.